You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators in this space. Ivan, another equine professional. We're on a roll. Let's get started. Oh, we're into large animal. Well, I'm Ivan Zach. I'm very excited about our guest today, Dr. Richard Markell. Dr. Richard is the VP of Strategy at Altano North America, brings a wealth of experience in healthcare, formerly a director at Butterfly Network and the U.S. Olympic team veterinarian, Dr. Markell's diverse background also extends to training for the National Conflict Resolution Center. Beyond his professional accomplishments, he is a passionate advocate for the bright future of the veterinary medicine, combining expertise, innovation, and commitment to resolving challenges in the field. Dr. Markel, thank you for finding the time. This is a pleasure to have you here. It's great to be here. I, I've really, uh, I've really been looking forward to this. I enjoy your your podcast so immensely, and and meeting so many of my colleagues in the field and in medicine and technology and innovation. So uh, I appreciate the invitation. Well, this is a yeah. Great. It's good to have you here. I want to, before we dive into the the equine, which is very interesting because we have kind of series of equine, I want to ask you about what is the National Conflict Resolution Center? So the National Conflict Resolution Center uh, is a nonprofit that creates trainings and lectures and mediations from huge corporations um, in around the U.S. and globally, as well as all the way to small nonprofits and uh, NGOs uh, training on how to get along and how to have conversations, which is uh, so important um, at this time. So it's a little bit of a a side gig. Um, I love doing it and I do a couple of trainings a month for them. It's a wonderful organization and we need to figure out how to talk to each other, even with more critical importance in these days. Yeah, it sounds sounds very true. Ivan, maybe you should check that out. I that's I'm focusing. I, I'm looking to improve my family life. So <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to ask before we get into the the company that you're with is what was it like to be the U.S. Olympic uh, team veterinarian? That sounds like a heck of a an experience. Well, I was one of the one of the team veterinarians traveling with them for um, I did it a little over four years and and it was remarkable um, to be around that level of sport, to be around that level of horses. I've been doing sports medicine um, almost since the day I got out of veterinary school and I just love doing that. And so many of my clients were all over the world. So many of them were trying to get on the Olympic team. So uh, when they asked me to be one of the team veterinarians, it was quite exciting and, and international travel and, and as well as working at lots of World Cup events, et cetera. Seeing what these horses and the riders do is is just amazing. So I'm going to ask one more stupid question before we dive in. Uh, my wife uh, did horseback riding for quite a while, and I constantly tease her because I say, well, the horse is exercising, but what are you doing? <laughs> so, even though it's quite a physical <laughs> sport. So when you're an Olympic team veterinarian, is the Olympic team, are they horses or Olympic team are the riders? <laughs> well, the Olympic team is the riders, but of course you need a, you need a partner. Uh, it's no different than a, than a business, right? You, you have to have great partners. And so we have these great athletes that are riders and, and they have great partners. And so it's, it's both of them, but we're, we're there to make sure that they have the best medical care and, and, uh, and constant attention. So the animals are safe and, and everybody is successful at the games. As far as your wife goes, um, uh, does she still ride? No, she's not, but no, not anymore. Oh. You, buy her well, you know that old, <laughs> that old joke of horses made me a millionaire. And the guy says, really? Is that true? And he said, yeah, I used to be a multi, multi-millionaire. <laughs> exactly. My daughter is growing up and she's three and now starting to ride. So that's a little bit of a scary there. That's amazing. I love to hear, what I love Olympics to hear that. I love to hear that. <laughs> Which Olympics did you go to, Rich, with the team? Well, I actually never went to the Olympics. We did the international events like uh, World Championships and World Cups, et cetera. And then um, the senior vet there um, did the Olympic game. So, yeah. And we got them all ready and right to all of the competing events. 
So let's dive into it. So very unusual, you are in consolidation of equine practices. And whenever I had several people reach out because we were working with consolidators and I was staying as far as I can from them, but I also stay as far as I can from horses since the vet school because they're big and bite. That's how I think about them. <laughs> but, but for consolidation, it's such a fragmented business. And I remember we were assessing couple practices and if as a veterinarian well, or as a founder of SmartFlow, which is a, which was the treatment sheet, electronic uh, treatment sheet that we developed, we were trying to do a charge capture in small animal hospitals because you want to make sure that every injection in the hospital, every medication, everything is accounted for and you're trying to capture those charges. And when we looked at the equine or large animal practice, the veterinarians in that business sometimes forget the entire appointment, not just a fractional fee for a medication. So how do you really optimize the billing, the processes, the how do you consolidate all of that? And then after consolidation, the hope is to optimize the business, I assume. So how did you get into it and where is the opportunity? Because it's a, such a interestingly managed environment. Well, you know, it's a great question, and I think there's a professionalization um, that has happened um, in veterinary medicine, in equine practice especially. Um, you know, it used to be the country doctor. I mean, when you look at the historical roots of equine practice, you know, they were oftentimes in the turn of the century, they were the town doctor for people and horses. So they were the most educated, most experienced. So over the years, it has become significantly more professionalized. You know, we routinely use them in our practice, CT, MR scanning, nuclear medicine. It's, it's changed quite a bit. So in that, the business structure, of course, has had to change with it as well. And, um, and also, we know, as we're talking about innovation today, the innovative thinking and how do we become more efficient with our practice, with our time, with our employees. And, and part of that, yes, a lot of our equine veterinarians are out in the field. So somebody comes up to you and asks you, hey, I forgot to ask you, I need a medication, and you hand it. And if you don't have a great technician there paying attention, we oftentimes will forget to write it down. But with technology, um, such as Takatu, such as, you know, our practice management programs, they become um, relatively too very sophisticated in being able to close those loopholes of revenue loss by not paying attention. The other side of that is we've had to really um, tighten up our medical records. Um, they are we're such liability in equine practice that uh, it's critical to have great medical records and um, be able to keep track of things that way. So Richard, a little bit of background for our listeners. Who is this large multinational company, Altano, that you're working with in their mar marketing or their North American division? Tell us a little bit about the company and, and give us a little bit of background on how this company started and why you've joined them as, uh, as an innovative leader and what gets you excited about them and what you're doing. Well, Altano started out, uh, I believe, in around 2017 um, with one large practice in Germany and uh, Dr. Victor Baltus's practice. And they, uh, he had a friend and they were approached by a, by a private equity company in Switzerland to, why don't we, uh, you have such a great culture in your practice. You have a, a great um, business structure. You have a great culture. You walk around his clinic and everybody's smiling and happy to be there and happy to be part of the team. What are you doing that we could bring to other practices? Uh, fast forward a few years, um, there's now uh, over 70 clinics and growing literally weekly, over 600 veterinarians, uh, 17, 1800 employees uh, in 10 different countries. And they approached me because I had worked for Butterfly right out of my MBA. And Butterfly was a technology company, is a technology company that has a handheld ultrasound machine. And it was originally um, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to bring access of healthcare at a low cost to the world. And they thought, well, let's do it in veterinary medicine. And so I introduced that device into veterinary medicine, loved the company, loved the device, loved the job, and then decided, um, wanted to move on after it was in veterinary medicine and, and successful. And this company approached me to do a similar thing, to introduce them into into the US. And the first thing I did was uh, went over to Europe with a colleague of mine and 
we saw um, Dr. Mike Pinnell and we went to the clinic and we saw this incredible culture that was so different. It was a very, if I can say a European culture of community. People were working together, not against each other. It was all about the team. It was all about bringing together these brilliant minds to be able to provide better health care for, for our horses. We thought, wow, this is really interesting and really different. And, you know, Ivan, back to your, your thing of avoiding consolidators, so have I. And I have to be honest with you, a huge part of our conversation is talking about how we are different than who has been there before us. And that's a challenge because there's that that thinking about uh, the, the perceptual, what what is a corporation going to do to us? So... In well, that, let's unpack that. Sorry, that, go ahead. A little bit about the consolidation, because you had experience through your MBA. We chatted about it in the green room about the what what the consolidation did to human world. So, can we take that turn a little bit and come back into what we're trying to do different, and hopefully, we will do different not only in quine but also in a small animal vet medicine. Sure. So I had a wonderful class during my MBA, and it was um, healthcare, economics, and management during my MBA. And we learned about healthcare systems all over the world. And all of us here, especially in the US, but somewhat in Canada, have seen the consolidation not creating any improved outcome, not creating better healthcare, not creating better access to healthcare. In fact, it's done the opposite. It's it costs more money for us. It's harder to get. Um, it doesn't reach as many people as we were hoping. On and on and on. And and the incentivization was all about medicine. And you know, I'm I'm very proud of my MBA. But on that side in human healthcare, it's the MBAs and the business side of things that have really damaged healthcare and and providing actual access to healthcare and quality of medicine. So I saw that and saw it happening in veterinary medicine, saw, you know, corporations and private equity buying practices and, you know, trying to squeeze staff and change into this box of how do we practice medicine. And then, of course, it, I guess financially for some, it's been very, very good, but it's really challenged a lot of what young doctors got into veterinary medicine for. So I saw it all Tano a path forward that was very different, a path forward that, sure, it's a business. You you can't just run a practice with doing everything everybody wants, because at the end of the day, you have to pay the electric bill and you have to pay the malpractice insurance, et cetera. So it has to be a business, but there's a way to do it with humanity and human-based leadership, human-centered leadership, really important. This company had it. And that's what excited me and made me interested in being part of this team and this growth. Can you unpack that a little bit? Because that is my goal. So I, you know, I pivoted from trying to consult consolidators into building a group. And, uh, and um, I see exactly what you're saying. I see that it is all in, you can make money, but you can do well by doing good. And uh the, what's lacking, I think, in our industry is engagement based on the leadership as a word. You know, a lot of the times you're imagining, you know, different style of a person, but I think it's a different organizational behavior overall and the communication and the pro- problem solving styles and how do you essentially make decisions in the company. It's not that the leader is different. I think it's that the leader actually steps out and let people to make decisions to the problems that they foresee in their day-to-day operations. So how do you how do you envision what is our profession is having ahead of us? What is that leadership style that needs to change to make the consolidation not a dirty word anymore? <laughs> sure. Well, I think part of it, I would love to say that every MBA has everybody in mind, but I think that if people look at leadership, part of the people, for example, in our company, it's 30% owned by veterinarians and led by veterinarians and the leadership team and the senior leadership team. So, you know, when someone meets me on an airplane and they say, what do you, oh, so what do you do in, in California? I say, well, I'm a veterinarian. I don't say I'm a business guy. I don't say I'm a VP of strategy. 
what I'm really proud of and what I love about our profession is being a veterinarian. So when I look at it, for example, when we look at practices, we're not looking at practices that we need to fix. We're looking at practices that have a culture that would fit into our group that we would want to share cases with, that we would want to ask them what they thought of those radiographs. And that's really that culture. And those are practices. Every practice has a different culture, but it's just like our friends. We all have different friends that think differently, believe differently, but we have so much in common. That's what we're looking for in our in, in our group. Rich, I want to kind of go further down that road. Before in sure. the green room, before we started the recording, we were talking about the differences that you've seen between companion and equine, smaller practice versus larger practices, and the different cultures within. Um, it'd be really interesting for you to kind of like elaborate on that point to our audience here, because I think there's lots to unpack there. There, there is really different. And by the way, I have a French bulldog and I, and I love, which is proof I did something wrong in my previous life, but I love her and we love our veterinarian. And I didn't even know they were owned by a corporation. So they've kept their culture and, and they've been great. But a real difference between equine and small animal is that, uh, and th some of this is opinion and some of this is, is certainly factual, but um, it's, it appears that a lot of people will choose a, a small animal practice by location, by history, by they've been going there for years, etc. Equine practice, they choose the doctor. Very few equine people will say, I'm going to use this practice just because I've been going there. For sure, a large referral specialty clinic, they may be the only one with a CT or an MRI in the area or doing colic surgery and they're going there because of that. But for the most part, people choose their doctor as a veterinarian and they look at their veterinarian almost like a pediatrician where they're taking care of their, their family, their but in equine, we have they're also taking care of their business for our trainers and for people that are in it professionally. So, you know, for example, um, we our outcomes are not just to make our clients feel better and our patients feel better, but it's also in the equine side many times to help the business and the industry that those people are involved in while keeping the horse first. So I think that's a, a huge change. The other thing that's that's quite different is I think, Zach, in, in equine practice, there are more single doctors or uh, a couple of doctors together than the uh, small animal practices where they're bigger groups. The difference there being is that that bigger group is really what we're trying to do in equine practice so that we can bring people together so that they can get one weekend a month or whatever their schedule is rather than every single weekend. You know, I, I work... 60 hours a week, seven days a week for 30 years. And, and I don't say that bragging. I, I'm now, I wouldn't do it again if I was doing it all over again. And I don't think it's a badge of honor and it's not healthy. And so I, I'd love to see the group idea of practice. So those are some of the differences with small animal and equine. Plus, the, I guess your patients will bite you, mine will kick you. They're, it's all dangerous. But those are some of the biggest cultural differences between equine, I think, and small animal. Well, that's great to hear that uh, that we're looking at improving the 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 equine through consolidation. So, so I'm very excited to hear that. And and one thing came to mind when you mentioned that you introduced yourself as a veterinarian, I found a very interesting thing for myself for the last six to seven years, I've been working out of the office more on the business side of things. And only when I went back to practice last May or June, my three-year-old daughter started being very, very interested in what I'm doing and every day coming into work to see what I'm doing, to check in on the dogs, to check in on the cats. And I did, I was joking that I was doing rounds with doctors first in the morning and then at noon with my daughter explaining all the cases to her. So that was super cute. And she knows what veterinarian <laughs> is as her dad, but the guy who sits in the office, that's not exciting. So so I agree with you. I introduced myself as a, as a vet. We ran out of time. We always do. Uh, and uh, because we promised these bite sites to our audience, but 
It's been a pleasure to meet you. We always meet uh, and with two uh, questions. One of them is their book. Is there a uh, YouTube video, TED Talk, anything that inspired you recently that you would like to share with the audience? I love, there's a newsletter called The Medical Futurist. And um, I think it's uh, Dr. Bertland uh, Mesco. And it's about the future of medicine, um, AI, um, technology and innovation. And it's, it's always fascinating to me. It's a human based newsletter, but it, as we all know, in veterinary medicine, uh, we've been leaders in many ways. The human side has been leaders in many ways. And so it's really interesting to, uh, I love that newsletter. That's awesome. We never had a newsletter. That's a first. So, uh, so thanks for that recommendation. Last question before we let you go is another guest that you think another innovator in the profession that you think we should have on the show. Um, I, I met a young woman uh, who was in high school at the time from Canada, and she had started in high school a AI technology company called Lynx, and it was for early skin cancer diagnosis in small animals and companion animals. And she was such a bright, interesting young person. And, um, and, and there were all these doctors that were getting around her to, as, as uh, mentoring her. Uh, she since started a, a bioengineering degree at Tufts University. She's a freshman and uh, she's really a remarkable young professional um, and decided she wanted to go into, uh, into the technology side rather than being a veterinarian just because she felt like she would be able to reach more animals. So really interesting young innovator that I thought would be great for your show. Thank you so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. If you want to hear about our new episodes, please follow us on any social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. See you next week.